to the NXT Podcast, your home for weekly NXT reviews and insight. The beautiful part of NXT is that when one dream ends, another dream begins. Find all of your NXT news, recaps, and analysis right here. So with that being said, we only have one question for you. Are you ready? We thought so. Let's get the show started right now. Oh, man. Welcome back to the NXT podcast. Zachary Smith, I am your host as always. Excited to be here with you. Went on a vacation that ended up taking longer than I thought it would. Uh, So the episode's a little bit late, but on the plus side, we get to talk about war games. So, not all is lost. I decided to kind of go over what happened in uh, in war games and actually pulled up a Bleacher Report article that kind of goes over the matches because I'm interested in, in what people think of it. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at ZachNXT at Z-A-C-H-N-X-T. And um, I thought it was a good show, man. Listen, NXT has been bad. Uh, I've been pretty clear about that for for several weeks now. And the lead up to War Games didn't feel special. It wasn't going to. NXT, the old version, was based on really, really good wrestling. And the story supplemented that wrestling. And so... The original NXT, or the last version of NXT, is the closest you were going to get in WWE to, like, a blood feud. Like, WWE doesn't do wrestling. They they say that all the time. They're not into old, like, NWA stipulations. But it is kind of a blood feud. We're going to lock each other in a cage. The bad guys have an advantage because one person comes out from each team. And it was a really interesting concept. And because the last version of NXT was focused on really, really, really good in-ring, when you had a TakeOver or a War Games or a Halloween Havoc, you knew that was, at worst, going to be a collection of excellent matches. And it always was, with only a couple of exceptions. TakeOver was, was applauded. Probably not watched as much as, say, uh, SummerSlam. That has a mainstream audience, but... Pretty consistently, I remember people saying, even those who preferred SummerSlam, I liked SummerSlam, it's a big spectacle, but man, TakeOver felt special. And that kept happening. Week, or rather month after month after month, especially when it would be a TakeOver on Saturday and a WWE pay-per-view on Sunday. Those are very different products. Now, NXT is, I don't really know yet, it's it's supposed to be main roster light and allow performers who are going to be mostly performance center performers from now on the more indie people kind of get a chance to trial run a, a WWE main roster run because it's not so much that it's main roster it's that it's the main television show. They shoot things a very particular way. Their stories are very beat for beat. They're more interested in you looking at the right camera than you telling the right story. And they want to they they want to make sure that they a person fits into that. And so their idea for that was to create basically FCW with um, more behind it. And just work out these developmental people. And that's fine. Makes a worse TV show, but whatever. (laughs) Who has to watch that every week and talk about it? But it it changed what these are. War Games isn't like a blood feud thing anymore. The people in it don't like each other. But this is like a main roster trial run. Now, I say all that to say, this is probably as close as we're going to get to an old takeover with NXT 2.0. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't a takeover, like an old takeover. But I think this is the closest you're going to get 
from NXT 2.0, and I thought it was a fun show, but I kind of want to see what everyone thinks. So I'm going to go down the Bleacher Report article here, and we'll get a chance to talk about some of the matches here. So the women's war games match Dakota Kai and Kaylee Ray start. Kaylee Ray sure does feel weird since she came to NXT 2.0. Kind of, it's almost like she was called over and the people who made that decision hadn't been watching her or what she does. That's fine. And Dakota Kai is uh, still like a zombie person. I don't know. She's twitchy, dude. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. First person in is Cora Jade to the women's uh, War Games match. JC Jane's out next. Io Shirai, everybody comes out. Mandy Rose comes in last. She's kind of focusing on Cora Jade for a bit. They have a little uh, thing going on with Cora uh, pinning Mandy off the distraction a couple weeks ago. Talked about that show. But it ends, surprisingly, with Cora Jade winning she pins jc jane that's i don't know if it's i don't know if it's like important in wwe i don't know if they think this way but that's kind of a announcing that somebody is is next up kind of thing to do there's a lot of people in that war games match who could have had win and you did cora jade that's cool I, I will give this show all the crap in the world when it deserves it, and a lot of times it has. I appreciate you listening to these episodes. Um, but I, I don't know. I, it, I hope that they do something with that, I guess would be my thing. Because, like, Hit Row was featured prominently, and then now all of them were released. So, like, I don't know. I I hope that this is a continued trend and they don't find a reason to not like her like they tend to do. But Cora Jade's cool. I think she could be special. She's obviously really young. She's really talented. So, yeah, let's do it. I love that. Kyle O'Reilly and Vaughn Wagner challenge Imperium for the NXT tag titles. Remember, we have tag titles. It's easy to forget, um, you know. Listen, you knew Kyle O'Reilly was gonna lose. The Kyle O'Reilly and uh, and his his new his new best bud Von Wagner lose. I still don't know what to do with Von Wagner. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. He seems out of place no matter where he is. Not because he's. Not talented, it's just I, I do a double take at him whenever he's on screen in anything. And I don't know if that's because he's like brand new and I don't know anything about him. Or if I'm still holding on to him being in the NXT title match like completely randomly. I don't know what I'm doing there. I don't know. I, I need to like learn more about Von Wagner, I think, is is what I think. Um... Von Wagner goes to turn on Kyle O'Reilly, by the way, uh, in frustration, and Kyle O'Reilly beats him up. Uh, there's some speculation that Kyle O'Reilly's contract might be up. He might go to AEW. Uh, I will say, a lot of people think Kyle O'Reilly's a charisma vacuum, and, like, why would you want him? I will say fair enough based on what we have seen recently, but they used him correctly when he was, like, in Undisputed Era. They they had him do the things he does well. And one of those things is not standing in the middle of a ring and doing a promo. And that's fine. He, he is, he is really, really funny. He does physical comedy that kind of radiates off the screen without him talking, whether it's his entrance or a match or whatever. And, and now they don't do that. So I will say, while you can say he's a charisma vacuum with the role he is. If he were to be brought into, say, an AEW, and they used him in the correct way, he would be really great for that company. Cameron Grimes and Duke Hudson, I will remind you uh, that this is a feud that started because of a haircut, that Cameron Grimes kept his hair long because it reminded him of who he was and where he came from, so on and so forth. I did ask this question on the last show, and I do I do sincerely wonder if Cameron Grimes knows that the hair will grow back, because I get being upset. I don't know 
that I'd be so upset that I'd risk the rest of the hair that I do have just to fight a guy that I probably could have just asked to fight or like gone and, you know, fought, I guess. Um, so Cameron Grimes wins. Um, I mean, as soon as we did the bad, uh, promo with Duke Hudson on the video screen that was pre-recorded, um, I was like, well, Duke Hudson bald is going to be weird. Um, if this were all about getting over the quote unquote new talent, I could see why you would think that that uh, Duke Hudson would win here and beat Cameron Grimes. I wouldn't even necessarily disagree with that sentiment, but I don't know if Cameron Grimes counts. Like, like they better never call Cameron Grimes up because he will he will become a shell of what he is in NXT, just based on the way they use him. Um, but Cameron Grimes is kind of an MVP of NXT, and I don't know that he necessarily falls into the older dudes that will be passing the torch category. I think Cameron Grimes is going to be one of their guys for a long time. So Cameron Grimes wins, and of course they do. The Duke Cousins going to attack him, but Cameron Grimes uh, shaves his head. So, fine. Uh, Roderick Strong and Joe Gacy for the cruiserweight title. I f- I forgot this was a match. I saw it and watched it, and and until I saw that title again, I forgot it happened. You're never gonna believe this. Roderick Strong wins. So I don't know what else you thought I was gonna have for Joe Gacy. And the the Roderick Strong cruiserweight title match. But I'm sorry to disappoint you. I got a lot less than you think I have. Um I don't know, man. I I'm a broken record, but the Joe Gacy character could have been really cool. Like it started bad and everybody was like, What is this? And then for a second we were like, Oh, well, maybe this is gonna be the really good thing we all think it could be, and then pretty quickly it stopped uh it stopped being that. Um there was there was like there was a real good chance to make like a creepy character or a guy who's really so angry that he has to hide it behind being overly nice and sensitive. Like he could have been insane. There were a lot of cool stories you could have told, and they picked, like, the least interesting one um, that we could have. So, I mean, Joe Gacy's actually very talented. He's he's very good in the ring, and I just want this character to be better because I think he'd be so good at it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is the Cruiserweight title. Like, Diamond Mine doesn't have, like, a ton going for it at the minute. Like, conventional wisdom with stables is that you have them win all the titles, or at the very least, like, the head of the faction is the world heavyweight champion. Like, Evolution at points, Triple H was almost always the world heavyweight champion, but then, like, at one time, Ric Flair and Batista were tag champs, and Orton was intercontinental champ, so they had all the gold. You at least want to have, like, the or a top title uh, in your group, kind of visually signifies we're here um the cruiserweight title i don't know how many steps down it is from that but i know it is enough that this feels like nothing the cruiserweight title started as a really cool thing there's a cruiserweight classic tournament it was all the matches it seemed like were fantastic and um You never thought the Cruiserweight title was necessarily going to be important. That's probably not the right word for it. But it could have been a really cool, kind of entertaining thing. Um, And for a while, they tried to make that work. And they tried a 205 Live thing, and it didn't didn't work. You couldn't capture it in a a bottle and keep it going. It was kind of a one-time thing and so we still have the cruiserweight title and it produces really good matches so i i certainly am fine with it being here it just feels it feels weird to have the head of your faction like the single star of your faction in the men's side having just the cruiserweight title 
And I don't know how seriously I'm supposed to take Diamond Mine as a faction. Uh, but it seems like I'm supposed to take them seriously. And I, I don't really. And I think it's because it's Roderick Strong as the head. And he's the cruiserweight champion. And uh, Joe Gacy lost. So, I mean, I guess it would have been worse if Strong had lost the cruiserweight title and then... And then they just show up next week like everything's cool. So, I mean, yeah, sure, keep it on keep it on Roderick Strong, I guess. I guess that's the level I that's the level we're doing, and that's fine. Alright, men's war games match. This is this was a cool this was a cool war games. Um this was obviously a, a really good match, first and foremost, as was the women's, but the men's and women's both had cool stories, and the men's side had the kind of cool angle of all younger dudes and all older dudes, like old NXT versus new NXT. And that's a cool hook. Like, all of those dudes don't like each other for different reasons, so they dislike each other strongly enough that we should settle this in a War Games match. Um... But also, it, it thematically sets up what NXT is now, which is old versus new. So that's fun. I'm fine with that. Carmelo Hayes and Johnny Gargano start. Johnny was wearing gear that was made up of pieces of all of his TakeOver gear, which was really cool. That came together awesome. I don't know who came up with that idea, but that's a good idea. Um, so Carmelo and Johnny are starting. And then Grayson Waller uh, makes his way into the ring. Pete Dunne. Tony D'Angelo. I forgot he was in this. That's weird. I forgot he was here. Ah, dude, Tony feels weird. So, listen. You knew you knew the new guy team was going to win, right? That was probably a given. There would be no reason to have the old NXT people win. You have Braun Breaker on that team. You have Carmelo Hayes on that team. They're going to win. And now that I know that Braun Breaker pinned Champa, um, now that I've seen it, that makes sense, right? I didn't think of it beforehand. But Braun Breaker is still very interested in that NXT championship that he just lost to Champa for. So if you're going to have Braun just be like, yeah, I lost, but I'm coming for it, the idiot. So if you're just going to do that, then at least you should have Braun pin Champa. Now, it's not a one-on-one match. doesn't matter. If you pin the champion... You should at least have a championship match. So, I could see in storyline, Braun and Champa don't particularly like each other. They could, At the very least, they want very much to fight each other. And you have incentive for Braun Breaker, and you have incentive for Champa. Problem is, you had Braun lose already, so that's weird, huh? But now, you kind of stumbled into, well, now Braun has pinned Champa. It was in a War Games match, but he still pinned him. So now it would make sense that Braun Breaker would, at some point here, be challenging Champa again for that NXT title. Now, that's fine. I don't. I I think of the NXT title very differently in NXT 2.0. I understand it's not what it was, and this is a developmental thing now. And it's not like, oh, the you know you don't have to worry about a lineage here. I, I, you can have Braun challenge again. That's fine. They had a really good match. And, and Braun's going to be a star. Um, you better, you better just, you better have Braun win then. Because if Braun Breaker loses twice, I don't know what you're doing with him then. Because then you have to wait. For somebody else to beat Champa before Breaker can challenge again, because he's not going to do it three times. And few things in wrestling will make somebody feel less special than losing a title match at the wrong time, or especially losing two. So, you again, 
you can totally do this. I'm fine with it. If Braun Breaker wins the NXT title tomorrow, that's fine. It was going to happen. So let's see it, I guess. We're not so much developing Braun Breaker as we're letting a dog off the leash and hoping it goes in the direction we want it to. And that's cool. I'm down for that whole experience. But if we're doing this now, then we have to do this now. It seems fast. But before we get bored of him for dumb reasons, or before you start to not like something about him, or before the momentum derails itself, Braun Breaker needs to be the new NXT champion. And I love Tommaso Ciampa as champion. I love that that story came back around with him and Goldie. Uh, But if we're doing the new star thing, then this is what Champ is here for, I guess. So, now, in hindsight, predictably, Braun Breaker pins Champa. Makes sense. I like it. Analysis from Bleacher Report. Seeing a DIY reunion on the night that could be Gargano's last match with WWE was bittersweet in more ways than one. That's true. Um, That's a good segue into talking about Johnny. Um, There were reports that his contract was coming up and that he signed, I think, an extension for one week to be able to do this show. Uh, It's very similar to what Adam Colt did. Uh, extending his contract to finish out his story with Kyle O'Reilly. Very nice of him. Very nice of Johnny. Um, So then, if all reports are accurate, then that would seem to mean that about Sunday, uh, Johnny's contract ended, which would mean he's a free agent. This is interesting for a few reasons. Um, NXT 2.0 does not, or rather no longer, lends itself to Johnny Gargano's strengths. Johnny's strengths are either being a really smarmy bad guy, or ideally being a really, really over good guy that fans believe in. And kind of the whole thing about that is that he has long matches. He himself said that, like, if he's going to go out there and have a 15-minute match, like, that's not even a warm-up. Like, he needs time to tell a story. And for all the things that NXT wants to be, it is not that and is not interested in being that. His longest match in I don't know how long had to be this one, and it's only because it's a war games. All those TV matches are fast now. I have to put a timer on it just so I can make sure I'm correct. So it would seem to me the least likely option for him would be to come back to NXT. What, are you going to stay in this weird purgatory? Are you going to go to the main roster and roll that dice? So that that kind of makes the least amount of sense to me. Now, here's the interesting part. is His, his wife also works there. Uh, Candice LeRae works there. She is pregnant at the moment, so you haven't seen her much. Um, so, like, I don't know what her contract situation is. I don't know if they signed at different times. I don't know if she's still going to be under contract for a while. So I don't know if Johnny, I don't know if Johnny and Candace are the kind of couple that want to work the same place. I suspect they might be like, yep, go do, go do you and I will catch up. So at this point, if you are Johnny, I, I would have to think that the obvious choice would be the same thing as it was for Adam Cole, the same thing it will be for Kevin Owens when his contract comes up. Like, what situation could be better than AEW? All of the things they celebrate, being plucky underdogs, being super over with live crowds, and just working with some of the best athletes in the world... And you get time to tell stories. There is no script. They let you do what you want to do. So if you want to be funny, Johnny, you can be. If you want to be super serious, Johnny, you can be. Point is, you make that decision, it seems. And then you get all the time you could want to tell your stories. I don't know what the reason would be to not go to AEW. And like... You could probably do something similar in Impact. I I won't see Johnny again. I don't watch Impact. But he could certainly do that. It would just seem to me 
that all of Johnny's contemporaries, the people in Johnny's mold that I think Johnny's on the same energy level with are mostly all in AEW now. Even if you were to stay in WWE, who's what are you excited about on the main roster? Like, it, there are a bunch of great guys to work with, but th- there is no guarantee. The point of it is not for you to go around and face the best wrestlers. The point is you you have a you have a serious match one week, and then you're on Miz TV the next week, and then you do your Miz feud that you have to do, or a Dolph Ziggler feud. It, so I I would think somebody as good at wrestling as Johnny is would see that and would want to go to a place that is as high of profile in some ways and and the whole focus is on really good wrestlers i would think that that would be pretty obvious he he posted basically a thanks for the memories or like a i love you all kind of thing kind of saying without saying and um, Bleacher Report's right. It was bittersweet. Getting to see, I love that we got to see DIY one more time. That sure does feel like the kind of thing you do if you're not going to be back. Um, both those guys are in different places. They're both they're both good guys now, so they can get along. Um, that's one of the best, if not the best, feud NXT has ever produced. And so it made that moment very special for those of us that have been around since the uh, old NXT. So, fantastic moment. Just Johnny getting to show off that he's one of the best wrestlers in the world because it was easy to forget because he's also very, very funny. And so you can use him in skits like he, he had been doing. But you forget that he is special in the ring when uh, you only focus on that. Um So if, and likely it is, that that was his last NXT match, he is absolutely, he's never going to hear this, but it does seem to me that I at least need to say thank you. Um, When you think of the best ever in NXT, people will say uh, Finn Balor or Shinsuke Nakamura or Samoa Joe they'll say they'll say a few different people um johnny needs to be high on that list johnny's been in several of mat- uh, several matches that could be in the running for best nxt match ever and that is very high praise from someone who watched that show so He's been here years now. He's had some of the best matches ever. And now, if if NXT were still the old NXT, we we might have a conversation. But um, NXT is something different now. And so from under him, the show he loved and, and poured everything into changed. He had no control over that. He had no say in that. It's a different show now, and so he extends his contract one more week to have an old War Games match and uh, finish out his run. That it's really awesome, man. Um, I I don't know him personally, but Johnny seems like a great guy. Um, it is it has been a joy to watch him week after week and put on some of the best matches I've I've seen, and so. Thank you. Johnny was the some of the best ever of NXT. And I'm glad he is leaving when he is, if he is. And if that's the last time I see him on a WWE show for the rest of his career, I'll look back on it, and, you know, with a, with a smile. The Johnny Gargano era was uh, better times for a lot of people who who watch NXT. And so getting to see him have the moment of his entrance with his gear and the DIY reunion and just reminding people who he is, that's an awesome way to go out. People have gone out way worse than that. 
And that's War Games. Again, feels like the closest we're going to get to one of the old takeovers. I had a lot of fun watching it. I want to hear what you thought at ZachNXT, at Z-A-C-H-N-X-T. Let me know what you thought of the show. Because I'm curious to see what everybody else thinks, because I had a really fun time watching it. I hope you did, too. If not, either way, I hope you had fun listening to this. That's it for NXT, so that's it for me. I have been Zachary Smith. You have been fantastic, as always, and thank you for listening.